This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter Six. Don Felipe Enares to Don Fernand. Paris, September. The address of this letter, my brother, will show you that the head of your house is out of reach of danger. If the massacre of our ancestors in the court of Lyons made Spaniards and Christians of us against our will, it left us a legacy of Arab cunning, and it may be that I owe my safety to the blood of the Abentheragith still flowing in my veins. Fear made Ferdinand's acting so good that Faldeth actually believed in his protestations. But for me, the poor admiral would have been done for. Nothing, it seems, will teach the liberals what a king is. This particular Bourbon has been long known to me, and the more his majesty assured me of his protection, the stronger grew my suspicions. A true Spaniard has no need to repeat a promise. A flow of words is a sure sign of duplicity. Valdeth took ship on an English vessel. For myself, no sooner did I see the cause of my beloved Spain wrecked in Andalusia, than I wrote to the steward of my Sardinian estate to make arrangements for my escape. Some hardy coral fishers were dispatched to wait for me at a point on the coast, and when Ferdinand urged the French to secure my person, I was already in my barony of Macumer, amidst brigands who defy all law and all avengers. The last Hispano-Moorish family of Granada has found once more the shelter of an African desert, and even a Saracen horse, in an estate which comes to it from Saracens. How are the eyes of these brigands, who but yesterday had dreaded my authority, sparkled with savage joy and pride when they found they were protecting against the king of Spain's vendetta, the Duc de Soria, their master, and a Henares, the first who had come to visit them since the time when the island belonged to the Moors. More than a score of rifles were ready to point at Ferdinand of Bourbon, son of a race which was still unknown when the Abentheragath arrived as conquerors on the banks of the Loire. My idea had been to live on the income of these huge estates, which, unfortunately, we have so greatly neglected. But my stay there convinced me that this was impossible, and that Quiverdo's reports were only too correct. The poor man had twenty-two lives at my disposal, and not a single real. Prairies of twenty thousand acres, and not a house, virgin forests, and not a stick of furniture. A million piastres, and a resident master for half a century would be necessary to make these magnificent lands pay. I must see to this. The conquered have time during their flight to ponder their own case, and that of their vanquished party. At the spectacle of my noble country, a corpse for monks to prey on, my eyes filled with tears. I read in it the presage of Spain's gloomy future. At Marseilles I heard of Riego's end. Painfully did it come home to me that my life also would be a martyrdom, but a martyrdom protracted and unnoticed. Is existence worthy the name when a man can no longer die for his country, or live for a woman? To love, to conquer, this twofold form of the same thought is the law graven on our sabres, emblazoned on the vaulted roofs of our palaces, ceaselessly whispered by the water which rises and falls in our marble fountains. But in vain does it nerve my heart. The sabre is broken, the palace in ashes, the living spring sucked up by the barren sand. Here, then, is my last will and testament. Don Fernand, you will understand now why I put a check upon your ardour and ordered you to remain faithful to the Reinetto. As your brother and friend, I implore you to obey me. As your master, I command. You will go to the king, and will ask from him the grant of my dignities and property, my office and titles. He will perhaps hesitate, 
and may treat you to some regal scowls. But you must tell him that you are loved by Marie Heredia, and that Marie can marry none but Duc de Soria. This will make the king radiant. It is the immense fortune of the Heredia family, which alone has stood between him and the accomplishment of my ruin. Your proposal will seem to him, therefore, to deprive me of a last resource, and he will gladly hand over to you my spoils. You will then marry Marie. The secret of the mutual love against which you fought was no secret to me, and I have prepared the old Count to see you take my place. Marie and I were merely doing what was expected of us in our position, and carrying out the wishes of our fathers. Everything else is in your favour. You are beautiful as a child of love, and are possessed of Marie's heart. I am an ill-favoured Spanish grandee, for whom she feels an aversion to which she will not confess. Some slight reluctance there may be on the part of the noble Spanish girl, on account of my misfortunes, but this you will soon overcome. Duke de Soria, your predecessor, would neither cost you a regret, nor rob you of a maravedi. My mother's diamonds, which will suffice to make me independent, I will keep because the gap caused by them in the family estate can be filled by Marie's jewels. You can send them, therefore, by my nurse, old Uraka, the only one of my servants whom I wish to retain. No one can prepare my chocolate as she does. During our brief revolution my life of unremitting toil was reduced to the barest necessaries, and these my salary was sufficient to provide. You will therefore find the income of the last two years in the hands of your steward. This sum is mine, but a duc de Soria cannot marry without a large expenditure of money. Therefore we will divide it. You will not refuse this wedding present from your brigand brother. Besides, I mean to have it so. The baronry of Macumer, not being Spanish territory, remains to me. Thus I still have a country and a name, should I wish to take up a position in the world again. Thank heaven this finishes our business and the house of Soria is saved. At the very moment when I drop into simple Baron de Macumer, the French cannon announce the arrival of the Duc d'Anguilleme. You will understand why I break off. October. When I arrived here, I had not ten doubloons in my pocket. He would indeed be a poor sort of leader, who, in the midst of calamities he has not been able to avert, has found means to feather his own nest. For the vanquished moor there remains a horse and the desert. For the Christian foil of his hopes, the cloister and a few gold pieces. But my present resignation is mere weariness. I am not yet so near the monastery as to have abandoned all thoughts of life. Osalga has given me several letters of introduction to meet all emergencies. Among these, one to a bookseller, who takes with our fellow-countrymen the place which Galignane holds with the English in Paris. This man has found eight pupils for me, at three francs a lesson. I go to my pupils every alternate day, so that I have four lessons a day, and earn twelve francs, which is more than I require. When Uraka comes, I shall make some Spanish exile happy by passing on to him my connection. I lodge in the Rue Ilrang Bertin, with a poor widow who takes boarders. My room faces south and looks out on a little garden. It is perfectly quiet. I have green trees to look upon, and spend the sum of one piastre a day. I am amazed at the amount of calm, pure pleasure which I enjoy in this life, after the fashion of Dionysius at Corinth. From sunrise until ten o'clock I smoke and take my chocolate sitting at my window and contemplating two Spanish plants, a broom which rises out of a clump of jessamine, gold on a white ground, colours which must send a thrill through any scion of the moors. At ten o'clock I start for my lessons, which last till four, when I return for dinner. Afterwards I read and smoke till I go to bed. I can put up for a long time with a life like this, compounded of work and meditation, of solitude and society. Be happy, therefore, Fernand. My abdication has brought no afterthoughts. I have no regrets, like Charles V, 
no longing to try the game again, like Napoleon. Five days and nights have passed since I wrote my will. To my mind, they might have been five centuries. Honour, titles, wealth are for me as though they had never existed. Now that the conventional barrier of respect which hedged me round has fallen, I can open my heart to you, dear boy. Though cased in the armour of gravity, this heart is full of tenderness and devotion, which have found no object, and which no woman has divined, not even she, who from her cradle has been my destined bride. In this lies the secret of my political enthusiasm. Spain has taken the place of a mistress, and received the homage of my heart, and now Spain, too, is gone. Beggared of all, I can gaze upon the ruin of what once was me, and speculate over the mysteries of my being. Why did life animate this carcass, and when will it depart? Why has that race, pre-eminent in chivalry, breathed all its primitive virtues, its tropical love, its fiery poetry, into this its last offshoot, if the seed was never to burst its rugged shell, if no stem was to spring forth? No radiant flower scatter aloft its eastern perfumes. Of what crime have I been guilty before my birth, that I can inspire no love? Did fate from my very infancy decree that I should be stranded, a useless hulk on some barren shore? I find in my soul the image of the deserts where my fathers ranged, illumined by a scorching sun which shrivels up all life, proud remnant of a fallen race. Vain force, love run to waste, an old man in the prime of youth, here, better than elsewhere, shall I await the last grace of death. Alas, under this murky sky no spark will kindle these ashes again to flame. Thus my last words may be those of Christ. My God, thou hast forsaken me! Cry of agony and terror, to the core of which no mortal has ventured yet to penetrate. You can realize now, Fernand, what a joy it is to me to live afresh in you and Marie. I shall watch you henceforth with the pride of a creator satisfied in his work. Love each other well, and go on loving if you would not give me pain. Any discord between you would hurt me more than it would yourselves. Our mother had a presentiment that events would one day serve her wishes. It may be that the longing of a mother constitutes a pact between herself and God. Was she not, moreover, one of those mysterious beings who can hold converse with heaven, and bring back thence a vision of the future? How often have I not read in the lines of her forehead that she was coveting for Fernand the honours and the wealth of Felipe? When I said so to her, she would reply with tears, laying bare the wounds of a heart, which of right was the undivided property of both her sons, but which an irresistible passion gave to you alone. Her spirit, therefore, will hover joyfully above your heads, as you bow them at the altar. My mother, have you not a caress for your Felipe, now that he has yielded to your favourite? even the girl whom you regretfully thrust into his arms. What I have done is pleasing to our womankind, to the dead, and to the king. It is the will of God. Make no difficulty then, Fernand. Obey, and be silent. P.S. Tell Oraka to be sure and call me nothing but Monsieur Enareth. Don't say a word about me to Marie. You must be the one living soul to know the secrets of the last christianized moor in whose veins runs the blood of a great family which took its rise in the desert and is now about to die out in the person of a solitary exile farewell end of letter six